Okay, good morning. Let's get started. So, um, this is the second to last week of class. So, um, just we'll talk a little bit about quiz two at the end of class. So, if I don't, if I forget, somebody remind me. Um, and so, before we start today's lecture, are there any general questions from last time or about the course? Okay, if there are no questions, let's get started. Today, we're going to finish up our discussion of RFX citation. And then we're going to uh, move into re relaxation um, and then talking about gradient and spin echoes and image contrast. Okay. So just to remind you, uh, where we left off last week is we are trying to understand how we do what's called slice selective or selective excitation. Uh, this is a sort of bread and butter of MRI where we go through and excite a slice at a time and image it and then go on and image the next slice. So that's called 2D imaging. Now there is, you can do 3D imaging where you excite the whole volume and do 3D Fourier uh, encoding, but there is still a lot of room for 2D uh, encoding, um, and so that's why we're talking about it. Okay. So if you remember last time, we looked at this video where um, there were different length pendulums, and it turned out that um, the pendulum that had the same length as the driving pendulum is the one that was excited. Okay, and this is very this is a really good analogy for selective excitation. So if you think about this, right, this is sort of like the gradient. Okay, in this case, the gradient is set up physically where we have different lengths of the um, pendulum. So there's different resonant frequencies. All right, and so only the pendulum at the resonant frequency the same that has the same resonant frequency as the driver is going to get excited. Okay? So it's the same thing, same principle in MR. Instead of a gradient with lengths of string, we have a gradient applied with our magnetic field gradient. Okay? Such that, depending on where you are, you have different resonance frequencies. And so when we come along with a driving frequency that has one resonant frequency, it's going to just only dr mostly drive the one that at that resonant frequency, and it's not going to be as effective at exciting the other spins. So that's the basic idea. Okay. The problem with that is it can only excite spins in one location effectively. Okay. But what we want to do is we want to be able to excite spins in a slice and we want to be able to designate how thick that slice is. Right? You might want to say I want a 2 millimeter thick slice and the next day you say I want a 4 millimeter thick slice. So we want to be able to control the slice thickness and not just be limited to just exciting a single plane of um, spins. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we would do that. And this is the basic idea. So if this is my object here, and I want to basically excite a slice of thickness delta z. Okay. So essentially the idea is I want to excite every spin within that delta z. Okay. And the idea is that Every, I've applied a gradient g sub z here. So each of these spins here within that volume has a different resonant frequency. Okay? So, uh, for example, this spin here might have f minus, this spin here might have f plus, and let's say this spin here has f zero. So there's a range of resonant frequencies. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to give each spin their own resonant frequency. So I want to come in with a waveform that has a range of frequencies, such that every spin in that slice will get its, its resonant frequency. So what that means is I want to come in with a waveform. If I look at this, this is the frequency axis. The waveform that I use to excite it must have frequencies from F minus to F plus. Okay, I want to span that range. Okay? And we're going to call that range the bandwidth. Okay? So whatever pulse I use to excite, so let's say this is the resonant, this is the main frequency, F naught, which is equal to you know, gamma over 2 pi B naught. So that's the main, the main sort of frequency at isocenter, which is just gamma over 2 pi times B naught. I want to go plus and minus that frequency, so I extend all the spins equally within some bandwidth. And that's the basic idea behind slice selection. All right. So now we can talk about how do we actually design the slice. So this is represented in frequency domain as we want something of the form rect of f over the bandwidth. 
Okay. And what's the bandwidth? The bandwidth is basically, what's the difference? The bandwidth is essentially my F plus minus my F minus, sort of the, the upper frequency minus the lower frequency. Um, and that's just given by gamma over 2 pi GZ times delta Z. Okay, because remember this one here, this this delta, this this has a basically is going to have its frequency is going to be uh, gamma over two pi g z delta z over two, and this is going to be relatively minus gamma over two pi g z delta z over two, because g z times the distance, the offset is what sort of gives you the the, the incremental magnetic field. All right. So, so once I know, so typically I'm going to give a delta z, and then I want to define, I want to design my gradient gz to get the bandwidth. Okay, and what's the bandwidth going to be equal to? Well, if I have a rect function in the Fourier domain, I know I'm going to have a sinc function in the time domain. So I'm going to want to excite my magnetization with something that has a sinc envelope to it. All right. So we can take the Fourier transform of this, or the inverse transform of that, and we get from the scaling theorem bandwidth times sinc bw times t. All right. So where will this have its first zero at? So let's say this is this is t. The first zero is going to occur where? At t equals what? Um, okay. So. 2 pi over what? Bw. Okay, so that's one possibility. Any other guesses? It's actually a lot simpler than that. It's just 1 over the bandwidth. Okay? Remember, because sync, remember the sync function has its zeros at integer values of its argument, right? So its sync of 1 is 0. So when bandwidth times t equals 1, that's my first 0. So that means t is just 1 over the bandwidth. All right? So there are there are de different definitions of sync functions where you have to carry around the two pi, but we like to be lazy, so we want to just keep things to the simplest definition, okay? Which is sine pi x over pi x. Okay, so that's the basic idea: is that we need to cut, we need to use a sync pulse to excite the spins in a certain bandwidth, and then all the spins within that bandwidth get their res get a resonant frequency. And are excited, and so all the spins in that slice can be tipped over. Right? So that's the basic idea behind slice selection. Question. Yeah. In the previous slide, where is our SOV, and like how do we define the limit of our SOV? Oh, okay. With respect to the image of the head that we just have. In the you mean this one? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, um, the FOV, the delta Z is like your FOV in the Z direction, mm -hmm. although we don't typically call it that. So we excite a slice, and now, you know, let's say we look at the slice sideways, right, like 3D. So this is the delta Z, and then within that, there's an FOV of X and an FOV of Y. Okay? So if we took a slice of the brain, then, then it might look like, you know, there's a brain in there. Okay? So what we've been talking about so far is FOV of X and FOV of Y. Assuming we excited that slice, now we're talking about how do we actually excite that slice. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to do a design problem together and then we'll give you some problems to work on your own. So here's a classic design problem, or a very standard design problem. So let's say I want a slice profile of the form uh, rect of z over 10 millimeters, and I'm given a pulse of the form a times sinc t over t, where t equals 400 milliseconds. So the two things I can design that the pulse sequence has to figure out is what's the amplitude of the slice selector gradient to use? And what's the amplitude of the RF pulse to get? Let's say I want a 90 degree flip angle. So we're going to come together. Um, so the first thing is let's write down what our parameters are. So we know that delta Z is equal to 10 millimeters, right? Okay. So therefore, we know from before we want something that's going to give us a bandwidth of gamma over 2 pi GZ times delta z, right? And we already know delta z. And what we don't, what we want to figure out is, you know, what's the bandwidth and what's the g sub z? 
All right, so we need, so obviously we need to be given information about one of those. So what do we actually know? Do we know something about G sub Z or do we know something about the bandwidth? Bandwidth, right? So what do we know about the bandwidth? What is the bandwidth here? One over T, yeah. Okay, so it's just one over 400 times 10 to the minus six. All right, so we can plug that in. So we have one over 400 times 10 to the minus six, and then we just solve for G sub Z. All right, so that's how that design problem would work. Okay. So that's sort of spelled out for you here, where we have, we know the bandwidth, uh, sorry, the bandwidth is equal to one over T, right? So that's what that over there. And then, so we have Gam G sub Z equals, we take the gamma over 2 pi to the other side, we have the T on the bottom, we have the delta Z, and in this case we get 0.587 gauss per centimeters. All right, any questions on that? Okay. So now the next question is, we know that this is a sink, you know, of T over 400, right? But we don't know what its amplitude is. Okay, so now we want to figure out what's the amplitude of a sink function that is going to give me a 90 degree flip angle pulse. Okay, so I've already figured out the slice suction part. I'm, I'm getting a slice that's a thickness, uh, what was it, 10 millimeters, so that's okay. So my gradient, the combination of my bandwidth and my gradient give me the slice thickness. Now I want to figure out how big do I make that pulse to get 90 degree flip angle. So here's the slice suction problem. So I want to go, I want a theta of pi over two, okay? And remember, you can go back to this formula we talked about before. Theta is just gamma times the area under my pulse. So whatever pulse I have, whether it's a sink pulse or a rect pulse, you just take gamma times the area of your pulse, and that gives you your flip angle. All right. So then we have, let's say, so we have the form B is A times the sink function. Okay. Now I have to integrate this sink function. But you remember, I think, I forget when we did it, but we talked about What's the area of a sink function? Okay. Well, it's just the value of its Fourier transform evaluated at frequency of zero. All right. So we can use that trick, so we don't have to integrate the sink function. So I can just take the Fourier transform of the sink function evaluated at f equals zero, and I use the scaling theorem. So the Fourier transform of that gives me t rect f t at f equals zero. What is the rect function equal to? Just one, right? So I end up with a very simple thing, gamma times A times T. I just set that equal to pi over 2, and I solve for A. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, great. So the next couple of things are going to be multiple choice questions. So you can just, I'll open up the poll for this. So uh, here's the first one. Um, you have an RF sync pulse to excite a slice that's two millimeters thick with a slice like gradient of two gauss per centimeter. The user comes in and doubles the slice thickness to four millimeters. If you keep the RF pulse the same, what should you do to the slice like gradient to keep this, uh, to double the slice thickness? Okay, so I'll open up the poll and go ahead and feel free to discuss that with your neighbors and we'll give this a few minutes. I can find my mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, let's take a look at this uh, question. So um, we know that bandwidth is equal to gamma over 2 pi gz times delta z, right? So has the bandwidth changed here? No. No, right? Because sync is the same. RF not changed, right? So we haven't changed the bandwidth of our pulse. So we've changed, so we know that this is going to stay constant, right? Okay, so the um, the delta z has gone up by a factor of two, right? So what must g z do to keep the bandwidth the same? Go down by a factor of two. Okay, so the answer in this case would be one gauss per centimeter. Yes, question. Just to verify, if the r doubled but delta z kept the same, does that mean that g also doubled? Uh, you mean, what do you mean by the RF doubling? So, uh, if the bandwidth doubles, basically. Sure. Let's say we doubled the bandwidth, right? Okay. Uh, then you could keep the GZ the same, right? If you wanted to double the slight. Sorry, right? say that again? If you, if you double the bandwidth and you double the slice <laughs> thickness, then GZ could stay the same, right? Okay. Everyone okay with that? All right. Next question. Uh, so once similar to this, um, in this case, uh, you're keeping the gradient amplitude constant, and now you're asked what to do to the RF pulse. Okay.
Okay, let's take a look at this. Um, so once again, we're going to start off with this fundamental equation. The bandwidth is equal to gamma over 2 pi gz times delta z, right? So in this case, we have, uh, what have we done? We've doubled this, right? We made this go by a factor of 2. Uh, it's saying gz is the same, right? So we don't change that. Okay. So therefore, the bandwidth has to go by a factor of 2, right? Uh, and the bandwidth equals 1 over t, so the t must go down by a factor of 2, right? So it's either b or e, right? Okay? So that's the first thing you want to figure out. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone from a sync pulse like this, right, to a narrower sync pulse. Okay, so even if you knew nothing else, what would you need to do to keep the areas the same? You could increase the amplitude. So therefore, this is the right answer. Okay, question. Is T a period or it's not a period? T is the first zero of the sync pulse. Yeah. Okay, any questions? So these are very similar to, these were actually taken off of either last year's exam or the previous year's exam. So. This gives you a sense of what you want to be able to handle. All right? Any other questions? OK. So, uh, so what we've talked about so far is we've talked about we want a sync pulse. We want our slice select gradient. OK? Yes, question. Yeah. If it's a different pulse, you have to uh, do more stuff. But you're not, all we're going to talk about in this class is a sync pulse. So, but if you actually go on to design these, then it's actually a whole field in and of itself. I mean, there are people who specialize in designing RF pulses. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so um, there is this something else that is called a slice refocusing, refocusing gradient, which is basically after I tip the pulses, after I tip the spin. So most of the action of the pulse happens right around its center, right? So if I tip the spins and I apply, they're mostly going to see this gradient here. Okay? And so it turns out that I have to add an equal and opposite gradient to cancel out that dephasing 
such that the spins are all aligned. Okay? So when we say the spins are all in phase with a slice select gradient, it typically is the RF pulse excites them, but we've added this gradient to cause the slice selection, and that causes some dephasing, so we need to uh, add an equal and opposite uh, rephasing pulse. So this is what's called the slice refocusing gradient. So when you see RF pulse sequ MRI pulse sequences, you'll, you'll see something very similar to this. Um, and then this part here is the spin warp that we talked about before. Question. Um, yeah, so to, to give you the full answer, it would be another lecture, which will, and I'll give you a sense of why that is, and, and if anyone really, really wants to know, I'm happy to give a supplementary lecture, but, you know, let me know. Um, but uh, it's basically the idea is that um, intuitively the sync pulse goes on for this time, but most of the stuff happens where it's really big, right? Just and, and all the other stuff sort of takes care of, every, you know, sums up to, to cancel everything else out. But the first approximation you can think of, mostly it happens at its peak. So if I tip all the spins at this, let's call this time T0, and I apply this gradient, that's going to dephase the spins, right? So I need to rephase them, okay? So that's the simple explanation. That, uh, I'll give you a sense of what the full explanation looks like in a few slides. Uh, but just sort of to introduce you, so when we, when we show RF uh, MRI pulse sequences, you'll often see something like that. And so, um, and so basically uh, what we call this is we call this full pulse sequence now a gradient echo pulse sequence. Okay? Uh, and the reason we call it a gradient echo is because if we go back to the spin warp pulse sequence, remember this was the initial dephasing pulse to take us out to like minus kx max, right? And so that, de that sort of dephase the spins to take us out to some place in k-space. And then the readout gradient, as we move along here, at some point, when the areas cancel out, we'll be at the center of k-space again. Okay, so that's called gradient focusing or gradient echo. All right? And so wherever the spins return to k equals zero is typically where we say we have an echo. So if you hear, hear the term gradient echo, this is the pulse sequence. And this is like the bread and butter uh, most pulse sequences clinically are either some form of what's called gradient echo or something called spin echo, which we'll talk about uh, later today. So uh, this is just going to, the next few slides are just to give you a sense of what RF pulse sequence design, uh, how far you can take it. It turns out that any, you can actually get any pattern you want by just having the gradients and the RF pulse designing them in, in the proper way. And the, it turns out that Basically, you use the gradients to go through k-space, and then you weight that trajectory. This is going to be your gamma times your b1. Okay? So this was actually first uh, explained by John Pauly, who uh, did this when he was a graduate student at Stanford, and it's now, you know, he's a professor there now. So he, this is sort of the, one of the fundamental findings in MRI uh, back in 1989. Okay? Before this, people didn't really understand how to design RF pulses, and this basically explained how to do it. Uh, so for the simple case of an RF uh, sync pulse, basically we can think of the RF pulse as laying down energy in K space as we go along in K space. Okay? And then basically uh, because it's a sync in K space, it corresponds to a rect function in, in our image space. And that's what actually gives us the slice. And it, using this theory is also what tells us why we need the slice refocusing gradient. But we can take it even further. So this was actually from John Pauly's first paper where instead of exciting a slice, he wanted to excite like a circle. Okay? And so in this case, you see this RF pulse and these funky gradients here. And he's able to excite a, a circle of magnetization. Okay? Later on, um, this was uh, sort of for fun, but um, this investigator uh, took a picture of his wife. I think this is his wife. Digitized it. Okay, figured out what the Fourier transform of it should be, then took a block of gel or water or something, had the RF pulses and gradients set up such that it would induce mag the magnetization, excite the magnetization in, in the pattern that looked like his wife, and then he imaged that thing, and this is uh, what he got. So he basically took the information of his wife and put it into the, the, the spins. Okay, so that's what RF 
uh, this excitation case space um, can do for you. Uh, another really common application, although this is very simple, is what's called cardiac tagging, where you can actually lay down lines of magnetization. Okay? And so this is basically you're, you're tipping the magnetization in a way that it's either tipped or not tipped in some period in your object. And the cool thing is those lines are actually in the spins of your object. So now if it's in the heart, when the heart deforms, those lines will deform. Okay, because they're right, they're actually in the object itself. Okay, uh, so what cool things could you measure by having these deformation lines? Contractility of the heart, things like stress and strain, right? Um, so this is actually Professor McVeigh was one of the first to do this uh, many years ago. So um, very interesting uh, area. Uh, so anyways, that's one of the applications. So uh, for this course, that's all we can really say about RF. Excitation. Again, if anyone really, really wants electron case space excitation, contact me personally. We can set up another session, but I'll leave that to you to decide. Okay. All right. Any questions before we move on? All right. Okay. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the sort of the last. We've sort of had to build up MR in, in many layers. So this is really the last big concept you need to have for MR. And from the last two lectures, will be more on sort of applications and, and where MR is going. So uh, relaxation we've already talked about before in sort of general terms, and now we're going to give you sort of more insight into what uh, relaxation, what causes relaxation. So you'll remember there were two main things. There was the T1 and the T2. Okay. So the T1 was the recovery of the longitudinal magnetization, right? And the T2 was the dephasing or the decay of the transverse magnetization, right? So you may remember this picture where the magnetization starts off here in the transverse plane. It's going to decay away in the xy plane and at the same time the m sub z component is going to grow back. And those two things happen simultaneously. Okay? So they're somewhat independent but they are related in the sense that whatever causes T1 also contributes to T2. So you're always going to find that T2 is less than T1. All right. So if on a problem or a quiz, one of the, one of the um, options has T1 uh, less than T2, you can just say that can't be true. All right. Okay, so we talked a little bit before that different tissues have different T1s. And that's nice because then actually that allows us to create different image contrasts. Okay. So what we're going to do is spend a, a few minutes talking about what gives rise to T1 so you at least have an intuitive understanding of why T1 varies between different tissues. So the main thing uh, with T1 is you imagine you've done the experiment, you've excited the spins, right? They're in an excited state. And what they want to do is they want to go back to their initial state, their equilibrium state. So they want to give energy back to the environment, okay? Um, now, it turns out that to do that sort of just by chance is... is would take a very long time. So it requires something called stimulated emission. Okay? And this is something that actually uh, goes back to Einstein, where it turns out that if you have an excited system, it is much more efficient, it can relax much more easily if it can exchange energy at its resonant frequency. Okay? So imagine if you have like a, something shaking like this, if you can sort of have a sponge that has the right resonant frequency, it can absorb that energy much more than a sponge that doesn't have the right resonant frequency. Okay? So that's the idea. So it turns out that there's a sweet spot. So what's shown here is the T1 relaxation time here. And these are basically on the, on the x-axis is uh, what's the frequency of tumbling. So you imagine these molecules always moving around. Okay? When that frequency matches um, sort of the resonant frequency of the spins. Okay? So remember these spins have this this frequency associated with them, which corresponds to their energy level, then that's like the sweet spot, and the T1 is lower, lowest. Okay? When you're away from that tumbling frequency, then the T1 tends to grow. Okay? So for example, here, if we're going from ice to free water, and those, both of those will have a very long T1 for this, uh, for this system here, because the tumbling frequencies are either too fast or they're too slow. And what we want is, um, 
what um, is sometimes in this slide called the Goldilocks principle, right? Not too fast, not too slow, just right. Okay, so you can think about T1 is like the Goldilocks principle. Everyone knows about Goldilocks and the three bears. Does anyone not know about Goldilocks? Okay, great. Okay. Okay. It's not required for this class, so I figured I would ask. Um, so the idea is that, and, and what is that? So how might that tumbling come into play? So for example, imagine you had a hydrogen proton here that's within a, a larger magnetic field. So it's going to act as a dipole. Okay. So if you're if you're here with respect to the um, the hydrogen proton, you might feel the feel the field of in this case minus seven Gauss. But if you're here, you feel another field of like plus seven Gauss. Okay. So imagine this hydrogen guy tumbling around. This as this is tumbling around, it's going to experience fields of minus seven Gauss and plus seven Gauss, and if it just keeps moving around it's going to experience sort of a, a, an oscillating field. Okay? And if that tumbling is at the right frequency, then that hydrogen proton can give up its energy back to the environment. All right? So when you think about T1, you want to realize that there's a sweet spot. And then if you go away from that sweet spot, the T1 is uh, going to go up. Okay? Uh, so that's shown here. Run, once again, the Goldilocks principle. And in terms of actual tissues, uh, we, we differentiate between things like free water, which can go very fast, bound water, which are, are things like uh, water within, you know, close to like, um, uh, you know, in tissues like gray or white matter. And then we have macromolecules, um, which are, um, uh, you know, tumble much more slowly. Okay. So, uh, so one thing that we can get from this is that uh, if we increase the field, let's say the B naught goes up, then we know that the frequency is equal to gamma B naught is also going to go up. Okay, so we're going to move farther out on that right hand side. And so what it means is we're going to move into a regime here where um, the number of protons that actually have that resonant frequency that are actually tumbling fast enough to allow for the stimulated emission reduces. And that's why as we go to higher and higher field strengths, uh, the T1s tend to get longer and longer, okay? which is advantageous for some imaging, but not for others. And we'll talk about that later. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we can get from this is that it turns out that fat and oil, typically, especially at the field strength, clinical field strength of like 1.5 and 3T, tend to tumble right around the lawnmower frequency. And so therefore, they're very efficient at absorbing the energy from the excited spins. And so that's why fat typically tends to have a very short T1. All right. Um, and let's see. OK. Um, so that's T1. And then we're going to talk about T2 um, before we give you guys an exercise. All right. So T2, remember, is the, um, is the transverse magnetization. Okay. And this actually has a different mechanism, which is basically if you imagine a lot of spins in some um, uh, object, each of these spins has its own magnetic field. Okay, remember we said each spin is its own little magnet. All right. So if I have a spin over here, it's going to experience the magnetic field from all the spins around it. Okay. So if this has a strong field, if it's pointing up and stronger, and this is like weaker here then each of these spins is going to be like telling this spin in the middle either process faster or slower. Okay? So if on average, if these spins are all sort of giving a net magnetic field, then this spin might spin a little faster, but this spin over here might spin a little slower if each spin is experiencing different instructions from its neighbors. Okay? And that will happen when the spins are sort of just moving around like this, when they're bound. Now the spins are in like, like liquid and the spins are just tumbling around very quickly, then on average, they have zero contribution, right? It's called emotional averaging, where it's like this spin's like, you know, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, right? Because it's tumbling around. So this spin, on average, this spin has, on average, very little effect on this spin. So it doesn't get out of phase. So in liquids, the T2 tends to be very long, okay? So for like in, in, in uh, water, it can be like four seconds or something. Because things are moving around so fast that the average field that any spin sees from its neighbors averages out to zero. In something like bone, uh, where things, the spins can't move around, then each spin 
Uh, this spin might sort of see an average like process faster. This spin might see an average process slower, and things don't average out. So the spins can get out of phase, and the signal will decay much faster. So that's the basic idea that we're talking about. So this is the liquids, as you see here. CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, has a very long uh, T2, and that's because the spin contributions are averaging out. So this is uh, the demonstration of dephasing. And here is the, uh, the slide where basically you see T2, when the tumbling rate is very fast, there's motional averaging, so T2 gets uh, much longer. And as um, the molecular tumbling rate goes down, the T2 gets much shorter. Okay. Um, so for example, in bone, the T2 can be, is like less than a millisecond. Okay, so you basically have, you have to have very special techniques to image bone with MR because the signal is gone almost immediately. It's even, it's even decaying away so fast as as you're trying to tip it, it's dephasing. So it's actually quite a challenging uh, problem. Yep? Why is there a kink in the T2 graph? Um, I actually don't know. <laughs> so um, uh, I'll try to look for the answer, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Do I have any other questions? All right. Okay, so this is just a summary of T1 and T2 values. So you can sort of see for water, they're both very high. Um, and then if you look at ice, the T1 is very high, but the T2 is very short. Okay? And then for other things in between, like the fat and the, uh, for fat, the T2s and the T1s tend to be much less than water. Uh, much less than, uh, especially the T1 is much less than this, like the gray matter or the muscle. Okay, and then what we talked about was tendons here, uh, and these also have a very short T2, um, also because the 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 the, um, the tumbling rate is very low. Okay, so any questions on that? Okay, so um, this is the next question for you guys to think about and and uh, take a few minutes and look at that.
Okay, let's take a look at this together. Um, first of all, let's just rule out the ones that can't possibly be true. Okay, so uh, which of these has T1 less than T2? So C can't be true, right? And F can't be true. Okay, so that's, that's a good way of sort of ruling out things that just can't be true. Um, let's, now let's take a look at the other ones. So A is nothing happens, right? The T1s and T2 stays the same. That's probably not, I mean, we added the gel, it's going to change something, so that can't be true. Uh, let's look at B. Um, T1 it goes up to 1200 and T2 goes up to 1200. Why can't that be true? Right, T2 should go down, right, because we're adding, we're slow, if we add the gel, we're going to slow down the tumbling rate, and therefore T2 should go down. So this can't be true. So let's look at D and E, and there was, is it pretty really equally split uh, in the vote here? Um, and, and on first glance, they could both actually be very reasonable answers, right? Both of them have T2 going down, right? Now one has T1 going down, and the other has T2 going up. Or sorry, T1 going down on one and T1 going up on the other, okay? They're both okay because T1 is greater than T2, so they're, they're both okay. So what we have to do is we have to look at where do we think we are on the T1 curve, okay? Uh, and this, this, this question is, is, is intentionally ambiguous to sort of get you to think about it, all right? So remember we have this T1 curve, right? And this is like the sweet spot here. So the question is where are we more likely to be on the sweet spot, okay? So were we more likely starting off here, in which case if we added gel, we would go here? Or do you think we were starting off in this region, in which case we'd be going up like that? Go ahead. I almost thought you'd be somewhere in between those two tipsy-pointy circles, because if the bottom is a down liquid and the top is like a free liquid, it's going to be like water rising somewhere along that curve, and so moving it towards a gel would just move it into the other side of that curve. OK, so the other possibility is we've gone all the way like that. Right. OK. So really, we don't really have enough information to answer this question. So you could argue both answers are, are correct. So this is a very bad test question, um, which I think it was a test in 2016 or something. So I, I will try to avoid these sorts of questions. Uh, in this case, we probably would have had to accept both D and E. Um, but I think in general, because we, think, we tend to think liquids are, tend to have very long T1s, right, adding a gel to that, if we had to pick one, I would probably pick um, D. Uh, because liquids tend to have fairly long T1s, so I'd probably in this region here, and then I'm probably going down to this region here. I'm not going to ice or anything like that. It didn't say bound liquid, though. Oh, I see, in this graph. Let's see. Um, 
Well, let's see. Where did we say bound, bound water. water? Okay. So if the gel is more solid than bound water, it's different. No, bound water is for like a gel. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of not quite as solid yet. So anywhere you have gels or things that are squishy, that's like bound water. Yeah, they're already in the regime of bound water. So once again, don't worry about this too much. It was more just to get you to think about it. Um, okay. So any questions before we move on? Okay. Um, so the next topic we're going to talk about is uh, static inhomogeneities. Okay. And this is the last thing we have to talk about for relaxation. So the basic idea is we've talked so far about we have this big magnet which creates this uniform magnetic field, okay? And this, this uniform B naught field, which we assume is uniform everywhere, and we add these nice gradients, linear gradients, okay? And you pay a lot for this magnetic field, right? You might pay a million or two million dollars to have this very nice uniform magnetic field, okay? Uh, and then you actually shim it. You actually have all these operations where you actually put in little pieces of metal to make it more uniform. And then you even have shimming where you actually have coils to make um, the field more uniform. Uh, but what happens is once you put in any sample into that uniform field, if that sample has any magnetic properties, it will deform the field. So it will no longer be uniform. Okay. And so you may remember from physics, there are things like diamagnetic, paramagnetic, superparamagnetic, ferromagnetic. Okay. So in general, um, you can classify things into diamagnetic, typically, where they tend to repel the field. Okay, so the field lines will be repelled away from the object. Or pair or ferromagnetic, where it will tend to attract the field and the field lines will concentrate. Yes? Of which kind? Oh. It, it's, yeah, there's some examples there. Um, so like um, water, which there's a lot of, and, and most biological tissues are diamagnetic, um, but there are a lot of things that are paramagnetic, including uh, um, you know, hemoglobin and things like that. Okay? Um, so the, the bottom line is we have both in the body, and, and so actually it um, depends. So the idea is that anywhere you have a biological tissue, you're going to have in homogeneities in your field. You just can't, very hard to get around that, although there are people trying to fix it, but in general, that's something you have to live with. Uh, this is an example of in homogeneities. This is sort of the anatomic picture. Whoops. Uh, these are slices of somebody's brain. I forget who. Um, and um, on the left are, these are B naught map. These are uh, field maps. So you can think of that, this is the actual, the field in that person. So dark would mean the field is lower, white is the field is higher. Okay. So in this person, and this is very common, that the field is much lower uh, towards the front of the head. Okay. Or there's a great perturbation of the field at the front of the head. So can anyone think of why that might be the case? What, what do you have at the, what anatomically is very different at the front of your head? Yeah, you've bone and cartilage, but you've got bone everywhere, right? I mean, so what specifically is very unique about the front of your head? Yeah, you have sinuses. So sinuses are these big air pockets, right? So you've got a lot of air pockets at the front of your head. So you have this, this big interface between, you've got tissue and then air uh, within the tissue, and so that causes a lot of inhomogeneity. So uh, what we want to look at is what's the effect of signal inhomogeneities. And so, for example, here we're imagining we're in an area where there's not, in this region here, the colors are showing sort of the, the differences in field. It's not too much. And so if you imagine spins within that vicinity of that, so we had spins all over here, then after, they, they dephase a little bit depending on where they are in the field. So those spins that are in the yellow would go faster. Those spins that are in the blue would go slower. And on average, at the end of the day, when you sum them all up, there will be some decrease, right, in the, the net signal that you have. Okay? And so that is the, the inhomogeneity re, uh, uh, causing a, a signal decrease. 
Now, if I increase the inhomogeneity even more, so now the, the red is redder and the blue is bluer, now the spins are going to get even more out of phase. And so the, the resulting MR signal is going to be even smaller. Okay? So this is just showing how inhomogeneities in the field can give rise to signal decay. Uh, so the way we do that is you can ignore all this except for here. Be previously, we had e to the minus t over t2. Okay? So we talked about t2 decay. Now we're going to say there's still that T2 decay, but there's an additional T2 prime decay. Okay, so we're going to actually give this T2 prime. Okay, and that's the part that's the static inhomogeneity part. So the two together give rise to what's called T2 star, which is the transverse uh, re relaxation rate question. Uh, I don't know if it's really a good idea, but could you just make uh, uh, even if B naught, the bigger you make B naught, the worse it gets, right? Because this is something perturbing B naught. Yeah. So actually, as you go to higher fields, this actually becomes a bigger problem, right? Because the, the, the difference is proportional. Like if you have like a metal object in a big field, it's going to really concentrate them. You know, the, the actual delta B is going to be bigger. Another question. To that point. So increasing the strength of your magnetic field when you're building bigger, more powerful magnets yep. becomes even more and more crucial. Is there like other ways that technology could be developed so that you can kind of get around it? You mean to get the higher sensitivity? Yeah, or not to have your stronger magnets sort of still have, or as you increase your magnet strength, you're also increasing the static inhomogeneity. So. Uh, is there like some other te technical step that can get done, or that is, you know, is being done? To get over that? Yeah, I mean, what people are doing is they're coming up with something called localized shim coils, where you, I mean, and, and actually, um, there's even some things where you know, uh, like to deal with these things, people put like coils in their mouth, you know, to to combat the field strength, or sometimes they put some graphite things, but that doesn't really work because no one wants stuff in their mouth. Uh, so then people have come up with like, you know, coils that you can put very close to your head or many, many coils such that you can somehow uh, uh, compensate for the fields. Is that the like mesh mask um, Those probably are not. Those are probably just to keep you still. I'm not really familiar with those mesh masks. Yeah. I've never seen one of those. Yeah. So if you have, if you have one, bring one in or send me a picture. Okay, that might. I mean, we do sometimes for kids. Sometimes for kids, they'll put on masks just so they hold still. Yeah. Yeah. So for adults, not so. We just generally tell them to stay still. Okay. And clinically, you know, you just you just live with whatever you get because, especially in an emergency situation, you're just putting them in. And, and you know, for example, if you talk to the chair of our radiology department, his goal is to have MR exams down to like 10 minutes where you just put them in and out. Okay. Whole body scan in and out. Okay. Okay. So, anyways, uh, T2 star is a combination. So it's defined as one over T2 star equals one over T2 plus one over T2 prime. So the most the important thing to realize is there's actually two fundamental contributions here. One is due to T2 is the random motion of spins, which we've talked about. Okay. And therefore, it's not reversible because it's random. You can't undo the randomness. At least no one has figured out how to do that yet. Uh, but the T2 prime is due to something that's static. And so, given information, you should be able to deal with it. Okay. And one way of dealing with it is what's called the spin echo sequence, which was invented back in 1950 uh, by Erwin Hahn at Berkeley. Uh, so just to remind you, this was the pulse sequence we looked at before for a gradient echo. Okay. And such that if we did this pulse sequence at the center of K space here, we would have a the, the center of K space would have a weighting of EXP minus the echo time divided by t2 star, okay? where we define echo time as the time where you go through kx equals 0. All right? So that's our definition for echo time. The problem is if you do that, you end up with these big holes in your images. Okay? So, so this person has something, and what, what do you think happened with this person? This person actually has teeth and a mouth. Okay, so 
but their image clearly looks weird. So what do you think is going on with this person? No, no, they're just sitting there. So I'll give you a clue. This, there's probably this person was a teenager. Yes. Okay. Braces or some other dental work. Okay. Because that's going to really perturb the field, depending on the material. Yes. Um, it would mess up certain sequences more than others. If it's a spin echo sequence, it wouldn't. But we still always have to be very careful because it could heat up. You know, it could absorb RF energy. So, in general, you know, people have to sort of check to make sure it's MR safe. Yes. Um, I think it really depends on the materials. So, in general. In general, you have to check with the manufacturer. Okay. Well, yeah. like well, the no, it depends on the mass of it. I mean, you know, you can actually like if I go, I, I forgot to wear my belt today, but like if I forget to take off my belt, I mean, it is slightly magnetic, and I can feel the magnetic field tugging on it, yeah. but it's not going to go flying and kill me. Okay. <laughs> but in general, I, I do take it off. But sometimes I forget. And I'm in the magnet, I'm like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, but it's always depending on the force and the mass, right? So, um, and how fair magnetic it is. So, so, yes, that's good. Don't, don't ever put anything in a magnetic field. So I don't want you to think that it's okay. Yeah. Question. Uh, so the area around the mouth, why is it black then? Why is it not bright? Is it because we're not receiving any signals back from the brain? Yes, because all the signals are dephasing. So the spins in that area, they're getting out of phase, so they sum up to zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in this case, this person on the left probably has some metal implants. Um, all right. So the way to solve it is to apply what's do what's called a spin echo. And so, for example, we start off at time equals zero, and then at, and this is the echo time, which is where we're going to acquire this in our case space. Halfway in between, at echo time over two, we look at the spins, and they've dephased, right? So the green one has processed a little faster. The red one has processed a little slower. All right. What we can do now is remember we have these RF flip angles that can flip the magnetization any way we want. So imagine the spins like this, and they dephase like this. If I apply 180 degree pulse here, it's going to flip all, do a rotation of 180 degrees of all these spins like that. Okay. So now whatever was at the the front is now at the back, and whatever was at the back is now at the front. So now this guy is going to go faster and catch up, and this guy's going to slower and slow down, and so we're going to rephase. So that's the idea behind spin echo. So in this case, you see the red. The red guy gets promoted to the front, and the green one goes to the back of the line. But then, because the red one is spinning, isn't processing as fast, it generally it falls back, and the green one catches up. And if we wait the same amount of time, another TE over two, we have the rephasing of the spins. Question. How much does that increase your sampling time? Roughly, well, uh, for the acquisition, yes, roughly. For but if your T TR is already very long, it may not have an effect on your overall scan time. Okay. So this is a movie that shows what happens. It just sort of gave you a demonstration. So at some point, the spins get flipped over and then they rephase. Okay. So play that again. So they get out of phase. We flip them over, and now they rephase. All right. And one more time. Okay, so that's a spin echo. Uh, so a spin echo sequence looks like exactly what we had before, except we have this 180 degree pulse right in the middle. Okay, and so now at the center case space, I have this exp minus t over t2 weighting. So instead of t2 star, I have a t2 weighting here. Okay. And so this is an example here. If uh, if I did my gradient echo image. I have all these dark lines where there's inhomogeneities. Okay? I apply the spin echo image and it looks really good. Okay? 
So that's why Spin Echo is really one of the, the workhorses of MR because it's sort of uh, immune to these homogeneities. Uh, so this is the summary. So remember we have the T1 recovery here. And then here we have either T2 or T2 star decay. And T2 star always uh, is less than T2, right? Because T2 star has both the T2 decay and the T2 prime decay components. So you should always have T2 star going to be less than or equal to T2. Right? Okay, so now for the last uh, part of the lecture, we're going to talk about how do we actually use these properties to adjust our image contrast so we can get images that look the way we want them to look, that enhance different features of the, of the object we're looking at. And so for today, we're really going to just talk about two basic parameters. There's the echo time and there's the repetition time called TE and TR. Okay, so these are two of the fundamental parameters in any MRI exam that you need to adjust. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a saturation recovery sequence, which we've already talked about for spin warp, where we have a 90 degree pulse, and then we acquire a line, we wait, and we do a 90, another 90 degree pulse. So the waiting time between 90 degree pulses is the TR. Okay? So every TR, we acquire one line of K space. And then the TE is how long it takes to get to the center of K space. Right? So those are the two parameters. And so we say at the center of K space, uh, the gradient echo is going to have something which is, this is the density. So that's how many spins are there. This is the T1 relax recovery or relaxation. And this is the T2 star. Okay? So I have how many spins are there, how quickly they're recovering back to magnetization of M0, and then uh, how much they're decaying away. Okay, So can you imagine, basically, after this first 90 degree pulse, right? the M sub Z is 0. So I'm looking at this recovery here. And this is how much spin magnetization I have to excite for this next go around. Okay, So that's where that term comes from. So that's that recovery. And then this term here is within this time period there is going to be decay of the transverse magnetization. So both those together form my basic contrast. Oops. And then if I put a 180 degree pulse whoops, in there, then everything stays the same, but that T2 star now becomes a T2. Okay, so that's the only difference between those two pulse sequences. So um, if I want to get rid of this T2 star, T2 prime, T2 term, what should I do to the echo time to make this term go away? I want this term to go to 1. So what should I do with the echo time? Do I want TE very small or TE very big? Right. Ideally, I want to make it 0. Okay. So for a T1 weighted scan, we want to make echo time very short so that the, that term goes away. And we're just left with this density and the T1 term here. All right, And the density, we really can't do anything about it. We just have to live with that. But we can now look at, now how do we adjust this T1 term? Or now we can adjust TR to get better T1 contrast. So let's look at, um, uh, so there, here's the basic idea that behind T1 weighted contrast that some tissues will, if we have a short T1, we recover very quickly. So the next time we do next, the next time we're ready to excite magnetization for the next K-space line, we have a lot of magnetization to work with. If it's a very long T1, then when we're ready to measure our next line, we don't have much recovery. There's not much magnetization to work with. Okay. If I have two T1s that are fairly close together, so in this case, I'm looking at the T1 recovery of something with a T1 of 800 and 1200 milliseconds. So this is like the signal. And here, I'm looking at the difference of the signals. Okay. And you can sort of see here, the peak is occurring roughly at the average of the two T1s. Okay? So if I put the, the TR, these, these are both a function of TR, if I have two tissues with different T1s, one of 800 and one of 1200, then it turns out if you put the, echo, the TR around the average of the two, then you get this nice contrast between the two. Okay? So if you're given a problem where you have two T1 tissues, two tissues with different T1s, you know that the TR around the average should be um, uh, good for you. 
Um, these are examples of uh, T1 images where because fat has a very short T1, fat typically looks very bright on T1 weighted images. So in fact, this person here um, has, um, what is that? Let's see, lipoma of the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is that sort of highway of fibers that connects the two halves of your brain together. And uh, judging from the name, lipoma means somehow it must be infiltrated with a lot of fatty uh, tissue. Okay. T2 weighted scans, uh, now I want to get rid of the TR term or the T1 term, right? So in that case, I want to make TR very, very long such that 1 minus EXP minus TR over T1, this is going to go to 1. Okay. If TR is very long, then EXP minus TR over T1 decays away. And so I'm left with a T2-weighted scan that looks like that. And so once again, if I have two tissues of different T2s, then the difference typically occurs at an echo time that's between the two echo times, between the two T2 values. All right. And then finally, if I ha so this is a case where um, these are T2-weighted scans. So normal brain on the left and um, uh, someone with a, a cyst. And the cyst here is clearly filled with a lot of fluid here. Okay? And that's, remember, fluids have very long T2s. Right? So if I have a T2-weighted scan, those fluids will be very, very bright because they have not decayed very much. Okay? So therefore, you're seeing the brightest things on this image are these parts here. These are your ventricles which are filled with cerebral spinal fluid, which is very much, it's like water with, with stuff in it, okay? And then this is also fluid filled, right. uh, And then proton density weighted scans, uh, here we make the TR very long compared to T1, and use a very short TE, so at the end of the day, we're just left with how much, what's the density of protons in that image, all right? Uh, and so here is an example of the proton density weighted scan in a subject with multiple sclerosis showing that there's different proton density weighted sort of increased protons in this area of white matter. Okay, so white matter is the wiring of the brain and it's thought that, uh, you know, one of the things that multiple sclerosis does is it sort of attacks the wiring of, of, in your nervous system. And so uh, this is an attempt to sort of see if using proton density weighted imaging they could uh, better detect multiple sclerosis. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, I'm just going to describe this problem and then we'll pick this up on Wednesday. So this is a problem I'd like you to think about and then we'll have you submit your answers at the beginning of class on Wednesday. So um, these are three images of the same brain. One is T1 weighted, one is density weighted, and one is T2 weighted. Okay. You're given the tissues are CSF, gray, and white. Okay. So just to give you a sense of where CSF is, these things, the dark things here are CSF. Okay. So everywhere, and this is also CSF. Okay. So those are your ventricles. Right. So you're given the T1 and the T2, and the relative proton density weighting of it, the proton density is just a relative factor, saying that CSF has a density of one. Gray is 85% of that, so that's just a relative weighting. Okay, the gray matter is well. Let's talk about the white matter first. The white matter is the stuff that looks white here. Okay, so that's the white matter, and it also looks dark here. So that's the white matter. So that's the wiring of your brain. Okay, those are all the the fiber bundles going through your brain. All right, and then the gray matter is sort of these areas here that are sort of just at the surface of the, the white matter, so that's the gray matter. Okay, And um, here, it's sort of hard to tell, but the gray matter shows, um, so the gray matter shows fairly well here. Okay, So that's the gray matter. Those are your neurons that actually do all the computation, or most of the computation. All right. So you're given parameters for each of those types of tissues, and then what I'm what, you, what we'll have you guys do at the beginning of class on Wednesday is enter in um, values for, for, the, for T1 weighted, density weighted, and T2 weighted images. Um, what should the TE and the 
what should the echo time TE and what should the repetition time TR be to get those images? All right, so we'll pick that up on beginning class on Wednesday. And uh, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes now about uh, how we're going to sort of the, the last week and a half of the course, so some logistics. So um, there's two main events left. One is quiz two will happen next Wednesday in class. And then uh, the final project is the following Tuesday here. Um, and everyone has submitted a project, so that's great. So we have, I think, 14 groups presenting. So we'll be, I'll be sending out a schedule for that um, at some point. So what I want to do is, so I think everyone's OK with their projects. I think they all looked good, and we are, we've already given feedback. If you have more questions, please feel free to send us email uh, or talk to me in office hours. The main thing with quiz two is um, we will be doing some reviews for quiz two, and so we want to get a sense of what people need. Um, so, and there will be one. Ex there will be a very short homework posted on Wednesday, which is going to be basically multiple choice questions to help you prepare for quiz two. Okay, and the idea is that will be due like Monday at five p.m. Uh, there'll be maybe ten multiple choice questions, and then the solutions will be posted Monday night, so you can look at them. Uh, Lin Shan will then have office hours next Tuesday to go, and then Liz, you have office hours next Monday anyway. So Monday office hours, my office hours, and Liz's office hours next Monday. You can get help on the homework, uh, but it'll be an online submission um, Tuesday, probably 5 p.m. or so, and then we'll post the answers later in the day, and then Lin Shan will be available on Tuesday to go over the homework solutions um, and also to go over quiz two or past quiz twos. Okay? Uh, in addition, I was planning on, during office hours, um, going over the quizzes from 2017 and 2018. So I just want to get a sense of, I'll definitely do some next Monday. So next Monday after class, I'll do some review of quiz two um, in office hours here. Uh, and I'll also record it so people who can't make it have that. The only thing I want to ask is, does anybody want anything this Wednesday after office hours? And it's like Thanksgiving. I know most people just get out of town. So I'm assuming the answer is no. But if the answer is yes, let me know today. OK, otherwise, we won't do anything Wednesday. All right, we'll leave it all till next week. All right. Um, and then in general, uh, best preparation for quiz two is uh, look at past quizzes from 2017 and 2018. Um, look at the homework and office. Um, oh, and the exercises we do in class, right? That's your best guide to what you should be responsible for. Um, and really focus on making sure you understand the principles, because obviously the questions on the quiz are not going to be exactly like those. Um, OK, are there any questions before we end? Uh, yes, question. Yeah, well, there will be, okay, so let's, okay, so um, let's talk about the possibility. So we could have, um, so the options are there will be one next Monday, that's after the break. The other option is, um, I mean, we could do something, I mean, I could talk about some today in office hours. The other option was Wednesday office hours. Um, and then Lin Shan, you could talk to the TAs whether there's another possibility for a, a review session. So there's a request for a review session before the break. So um, if you want to think about that. So which of those options sounds the best? Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday office hours? Yeah. OK, so there is a desire for Wednesday office hours here. OK, so I'll plan on going over. Um, uh, so I'll look over the exams, and I'll, I will send out an email saying what will go over most likely on Wednesday and what will go over most likely on Monday. There might be some overlap, but they'll be fairly disparate. And so um, we won't necessarily go over both in any session, but over the two, we'll go over. And we've already done some of the problems from those exams in class. So that'll let us speed up. Okay. All right. So I'll send out an announcement about that. And um, yeah. All right.